All right, now we're continuing on in our series. We're taking a break this morning and next uh, Sunday in the morning from our series on the Ten Commandments because of the holiday, because of Easter. I'm preaching more um, sub, uh, sermons related to that subject. It's a real important time, and um, I feel it's important to, to be able to preach sermons on those topics. So we're continuing tonight with the Ten Commandments. And the, ten, the, one, the commandment you're saying, well, what commandment are we preaching tonight? We read Ezekiel chapter 33. What does that have to do with the Ten Commandments? We're preaching on the commandment of thou shalt not covet. It's the Tenth Commandment. It's the last one. And I'll read it for you. You don't have to turn there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. That commandment reads, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So he lists off a bunch of things that we're not supposed to be coveting. And what does the word covet mean? Of course, covet, we have covered this quite a bit lately. I was struggling whether or not I, I, I should preach it, but um, just because it's come up quite a bit, it's been a common theme in a lot of the sermons I've preached lately. But this is probably one of the most important commandments to be preaching on in our society today. This is something that, that we have to look out for. And I'm going to take maybe a slightly different angle with it. And you're going to see that we need to watch out for this. Especially when I get to the part where I preach about covetousness, not being just about money. Okay? There are, there, there, this is a very broad commandment of not coveting. Okay, and we're, and we're going to look at a lot of different aspects of this. Let's dig in to Ezekiel 33 a little bit, and hopefully it'll come a little bit clearer why I chose this passage as our opening passage on preaching on this commandment of not coveting. So, a very, very familiar, famous passage too, by the way. The, the whole first half is talking about the watchman. And I preached a sermon on this in the past. You know, the, the watchman, it just explains that, you know, in a city, and he uses this analogy, right? You have a city, and one guy is up there watching for the security. He's like a security guard, right? Everybody's safe within the walls of the city, so to speak, so, um, from an outside force, an outside invading army, or what have you. But walls aren't good enough if nobody's defending the place, right? I mean, if an army just comes and no one's aware that there's, there's an army surrounding the whole place, I mean, they're going to be able to bash those walls down and just come right in. Like, that's not, that's not enough to defend yourself. You have to have people watching and on the lookout all the time and being vigilant because when you see them coming from far away, you can prepare yourself. You can get all ready and then you know, be, be ready to go and, and, and not even allow them to come close enough to the city to destroy your walls. Um, just practically speaking, it makes sense, right? So you have a watchman. And he explains, he says, look... When you set up a watchman, if he sees the, the enemy coming, he blows the trumpet, he sounds the alarm. He says, if you don't do anything about it, if you hear that alarm and you're, oh, yeah, well, that's just one of those alarms. You know, like today we have the, the car alarms, right, that people pretty much just ignore because they go off for the wrong reasons all the time. People are fumbling with their keys. So they set their own alarms off and... An alarm is designed to draw attention and, and to get people to recognize something. These days now you have people, oh, oh yeah, the alarms. Even in your own driveway sometimes, it's like, oh yeah, that stupid alarm's going off again. And it's kind of defeated the purpose of even having the alarm to begin with. But if you have someone and they're watching out and they blow the alarm and you don't do anything about it, well, that's your own fault. He's saying, you know, the watchman did his job. He gave the warning. But if you decide not to listen to that warning, well, that's your fault. It's not his fault. But if the watchman sees the army coming and he fails to, to sound the alarm, he's just like, oh yeah, the army's coming or whatever. You know, I don't know what the motivation would be, but if he doesn't warn the people, then yeah, those people are going to die. I mean, the, 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 the judgment might come on them, but it says God's going to hold the watchman responsible. I mean, the blood's going to be on his hands. He had the opportunity to warn them. He had the opportunity to potentially save them if he would have just sounded the alarm, but he chose not to do that. And of course, this is, this is a, um, an analogy he's giving so, because the preacher that God sends is like that watchman. He's saying, you know, I am giving you these words to preach unto the people because they're in sin. They're in wickedness. And if you continue in your wickedness, God's going to destroy you. 
The judgment is going to come upon you. Now, this has nothing to do with our eternal salvation. People like to turn to this to prove their works-based salvation, and they'll turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Nowhere is this talking about your soul being saved. Nowhere. I mean, this is, this is very heavily works related when, when we're looking at, you know, if, the, if you turn from the, your wickedness, you turn from your evil ways, you do that which is right, you know, um, God's going to spare you. That This isn't talking about your soul being saved. Okay, I just want to throw that out there. But God has ordained people to be that watchman, to, to warn His people about getting into wickedness that judgment will come. And this is serious. And now the pastors that are afraid to preach the negative messages, the pastors that are afraid to, to say anything and sound the alarm because they think people might not be able to hear it or accept it or they might get angry at them or whatever. You know, the blood's going to be on his hands if he decides not to preach the truth, not to sound the alarm. And what this sermon's going to do tonight is I'm sounding the alarm on this sin of covetousness. Okay, and, and, this, and that's just the beginning of this chapter. Ezekiel 33, you know, and when that warning is preached, when that warning is made, we need, if, if, if we need to heed that warning, which probably everybody, when, by the time I get done with this sermon, you'll probably realize we all have at least something that we need to change in our life. Hopefully you can walk away heeding that warning, listening to that warning, and the repentance that's necessary to get right with God as a result of hearing that warning will save you from the coming judgment is as if you just fail to hear the warning. And this is an extremely important sin. I've got a lot of scripture we want to cover tonight, but it's no mistake that all, all of this passage contains everything it does because it, you'll find it is very pertinent to what I'm talking about. Now first, you know, that, that part about the watchman, let's look at verse number 24. Because this is, um, just let's look at verse 24. The Bible says, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore, say unto them. So, basically, he's talking about the people who are, um, this is after the captivity, but there's still remnant, there's still people left in the land, right? And their, their attitude, their mindset is, well, hey, this land, and this is like, I mean, a bunch of people are already taken captive, but they're saying like, this land was promised unto Abraham. This is our land, right? He says, Abraham was one, but we're many. I mean, there's a bunch of us. They said, he inherited the land. We are many. The land is given us for inheritance. And this is the mindset that's still going on today amongst Christians saying that regardless of what Israel does, what the Jew does, that land is their inheritance and it's theirs forever and it doesn't matter what they do. That's always a, This is the mindset that they had. But let's keep reading and look at what the response is to this attitude that they had. Verse 25, Wherefore, say unto them. Wherefore means because of this. Because they are, have this mindset. Because they're thinking that, hey, this is our land. We deserve to be here. Thus saith the Lord God. Verse 25, Ye eat with the blood. And lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. And shall ye possess the land? He's saying, look at the sins you're committing. You're eating with the blood. That's against one of the, one of the commandments of God that they're not supposed to eat with the blood. He says, you lift up your eyes. Toward, you have idols. You have false gods that you're worshiping. You're shedding blood. You think that you get to possess this land when you're committing these sins against me? Look at verse 26. Ye stand upon your sword. Ye work abomination, and ye defile every one his neighbor's wife. And shall ye possess the land? God's covenant was conditional. And we see that even here in Ezekiel chapter 33, they had this mindset to say, well, this is, this is our inheritance. No, it's only your inheritance when you obey God. And every time they followed, they followed false uh, gods, worshipped idols, and got in everything else, God always brought his judgment and took them away captive out of the land. And this was the state they were in, and they're still saying, oh, this is our land. And he's saying, no. 
This is not your inheritance when you're just completely disrespecting and disobeying everything that God said. And you have these false gods. He's saying, no. It's, it's conditional. Let's, um, let's keep reading here. Verse 27. Say thou thus unto them, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely they that are in the waste shall fall by the sword and him that is in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured, and they that be in the forts and in the cave shall die of the pestilence. So he's saying, look, and, and this is all because of their grievous sin. He's saying, you know, you think you're going to inherit this land, and I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to destroy you by all of these different means, these pestilence, you know, these wild beasts, whatever, whatever it is that's going to happen. He's like, these are all the judgments that are going to come against them. Verse 28, for I will lay the land most desolate. And the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate, because of all their abominations which they have committed. So, too often, unfortunately, God is only known to people when they're brought down really low when they're brought to desolation, when they're brought down to nothing, unfortunately, some people need to be brought to that state before they finally realize, oh, maybe we should get right with God now. Maybe it's time to seek God, the true God, get rid of these stupid idols that he's already told us to get rid of. We know better than this. Maybe we should finally get right with God. Unfortunately, that's the attitude that a lot of people have, not just the children of Israel had so many people have this type of an attitude. And um, it's actually one of the reasons why we are, tend to be more successful at soul winning and getting people to accept Christ as their Savior when we're in the poorer areas. People are having a lot more struggles and they're brought down a lot lower. They don't have the pride that comes with amassing a lot of wealth and, and a lot of gain and thinking that everything's taken care of because they've already been brought down pretty low. They've already been humbled. They have a humble mind and a humble heart. But let's keep reading here because we're going to see how this ties. We just haven't seen how this ties into the covetousness yet, but it does. Verse number 30. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another, everyone to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. So we think this is a good thing, right? They're saying, but it starts off, he says, you know, thy people are talking against thee. They're talking against the preacher in the, by the walls and in the doors of houses. But, it, but this is how they're doing. He says, they speak one to another, say, you know, every one to his brother, saying, come, I pray you, let's hear what is the word that cometh forth. Let's go hear the word of God. Hey, Let's go to church. Let's hear what God has to say. Let's hear what the prophet's going to say about God. What's the word that's coming from the Lord? Sounds like a great thing, doesn't it? I mean, what's wrong with that? They want to hear what's coming from God. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. So I, yeah, you see where the covetousness fits in, right? This happens even to people that are churchgoers, church-going folk, right? Hey, let's hear what God has to say. Hey, let's go to church today. Let's hear what the Bible says. Let's hear the man of God. They come, they sit down, they talk to their friends. Hey, let's go to church. Let's hear what the, what the Bible has to say. Sit down. They listen. They hear the words. But the problem is, they don't do them. And look at the attitude that they have towards their pastor, towards their preacher, towards the prophet of God. Verse 32, And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. They're saying, they come, and it's just like the preacher's an entertainer. Like, I'm just up here to entertain you. And maybe, you know, someone probably other than me has, his, has some great speaking abilities and, you know, he might be able to make you cry or make you laugh and do all these different things. But that's all they see it as. You know, you have a prophet, especially Ezekiel, you know, you're trying to warn the people saying, look, 
there's destruction coming. We need to obey God. We need to get right with God because there's there's going to be hell to pay. There's, he's going to make the land desolate. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. This is serious. And they look at him just like, oh, yeah, yeah that's nice. And uh, they'll, they'll sit through it. They'll listen. But it's nothing more to them than a song. Just someone who's skillful at, at playing music, singing a song. Yeah, they'll sit there. They'll hear it. And then they go their way and do nothing about it. And this is the attitude that people had. And he says, that's why I said at the end of verse 31, um, for with their mouth, they show much love. They're, they'll give all the lip service to God. And, oh, yeah, brother, hey, you know, I love the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. All, you know, we're going to church. We're doing everything right. But in their heart, their heart goeth after their covetousness. Their desires for things that they shouldn't have, things that they want that they should not want, that things that don't belong to them, things that belong to someone else, this love of money, love of other things, love of other people's wives, whatever it may be, whatever the covetousness is in their heart, they love that more than they love God. They're willing to say that they love God because who wants to say they don't love God? It's easy to say those words. It's another thing to do them. Amen. And this is, this, is, this is so important. God forbid our church would ever get to this point to where people just show up. They listen to Pastor. Oh, yeah, there's Pastor. Yeah, he's, he's railing again. You know, it's just kind of funny. And yeah, he preaches hard. And then you just go home and you don't change anything. It's just like listening to a song on the radio. Oh, yeah, that sounds good for a minute. And then you forget all about it and you keep on going about your business. Hopefully that's not what church is to you when you hear the word of God, when you hear the warning. This is serious business. I am the watchman for, for our area, for our church. I'm on the lookout. I want to make sure I'm here to help protect you. That's what the pastor is, the bishop, the shepherd right? The under shepherd of Jesus Christ to watch the flock and look out for the danger. And one of the biggest dangers, the, the reason why I'm here to help warn people is that it's not easy to see. We live in a blind, dark world that's trying to put the blinders on you so that you can't see how wicked of a sin covetousness is. The world's going to try to convince you that there's nothing wrong with it. It's completely normal. Hey, it's the American way. You should desire to have the big house and the multiple cars and the boats and everything else. Hey, that's the American dream. No, it's that may be the American dream, but that's not God's dream. That's not what God wants you to do with your life. We need to watch out for covetousness. The very nature of covetousness itself is such that it creeps into churches easily. Anywhere. We're not, you're not safe from covetousness no matter where you're at because it's a heart problem. These warnings that are preached need to be taken to heart. Tonight's topic, of course, is covetousness. We need to heed these warnings so that the Lord does not have to show you that there has been a prophet among you. Like he closed out here in verse 33, he says, and when this cometh to pass, he's talking about their desolation and their destruction and everything else. When this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. And the worst thing you can do is ignore the warnings, ignore the teachings, ignore God's word, and just have to go through something in order to gain that wisdom. When you don't have to go through it if you heed the warning of the watchman. Let's turn in your Bibles to, actually, I want you to see this. Look at Psalm chapter 10. So you say, okay, I get it. I get that you're warning, and I, and I get this, but we didn't really see a whole lot about covetousness yet. Yeah, we just saw that these people who weren't listening to the pastor, that their hearts went after their covetousness. First, I'm going to point out why this is so important. Why am I up here yelling about this and screaming about covetousness and, and trying to get it through your head that it's an important warning for your life? Here's one reason. Psalm chapter 10, verse number 3. Psalm 10, 3 says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord 
abhorreth. That word abhorreth is a very strong word. It's not even just hatred. Abhorring is, is, a, is a much more emphasized word for hatred. Abhorring is, 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 is a much stronger word for that hate. God hates those that are covetous. But we see here the wicked, the wicked person, they're the ones that boast of their heart's desire, of their wicked, wicked covetousness, heart's desires that they have, and they bless the covetous. Yeah, they're going to tell you, the wicked's the one that's going to tell you and get you on track to be a covetous person and try to steer you in that direction and point you into setting your heart and setting your mind upon riches and upon things that don't matter, upon things that you can't have or shouldn't have. But God hates that. And it's, the covetous is describing people, right? It's an adjective describing people, a covetous, whom, the word whom is talking about the people, whom the Lord abhorreth. He doesn't hate just the covetousness, as people always try to separate the sin from the sinner and say, well, God only hates the sin, not the sinner. Whom? Whom the Lord abhorreth. Those are people. Okay, if your covetousness, God is, is angry with you and hates you. This is the first reason why this, is, this subject is so important. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Again, just to lay the gravity of this sin of covetousness, which has been so accepted and taught in today's world, in today's especially American society of consumerism, where that just teaches you, you just need to keep spending money and buy stuff and get credit cards and you need it now and don't worry about it later. Go into debt so you can be gratified and satisfied right now with something that you can't afford and, and build yourself up into debt and get that car, get that house, get that boat, get whatever it is because we'll just finance it. And we'll see the wickedness involved. That's, it's all covetousness. It's all it is. It's wanting things that you can't afford, things that you can't have right now. I want to be satisfied with this. And the, and the world's telling you everything's just fine. This is the way it is. And, and everybody's doing it. And this is acceptable and this is fine. Covetousness is actually a sin that you should be separating over. Separating fellowship with other Christians over. This is a sin that can get people kicked out of a church. If there's a person that's called a brother, we're going to read that here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, and they're covetous, they desire all these things that they can't have, that person doesn't belong in church. They need to be kicked out until they can get right with God. That's a serious sin because it's not just every sin that gets you kicked out of church. Let's read the list here. Look at, let's start reading in verse number 6. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And this is this, the reason this starts off with this. This is one of the reasons why people need to be kicked out of church. Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And certain leavens is going to infect everybody in the church. That's why they get removed. That's why they get kicked out. We say, yeah, but shouldn't that person be in church more because they need it more? Because they have these problems? Not, no, not if they have these particular sins. They need to be out because these are, are larger sins. They're greater sins. And, and we're also going to point out too that this is someone that's called a brother. This isn't your brand new convert. Okay, this isn't someone that just got saved or got saved and just never really knew anything about the Bible and just get started learning, okay? And it's important to point that out because the Bible makes that distinction as well when it says when anyone is called a brother. Let's keep reading. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet, 
not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer, a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The person who is covetous is a wicked person that needs to be put away from among us. But notice he says, he's saying, look, I know in the world you've got the fornicators, you've got the drunkards, you've got the extortioners, you've got the covetous, you know, that, that's out there. He says, if you had to avoid all that, you'd have to just completely remove yourself from the world. And that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to just go out and start some commune somewhere and not have any interaction with the outside world. He's saying, I, I get that. But in the house of God, amongst God's people, those that call each other brother, so-and-so, sister, so-and-so, like, like you're in the church, you know better, you've heard God's word, you've been here, and you're still just, just consciously making that choice to be like, no, I'm going to be a drunk, or I'm going to be an extortioner, or I'm going to be covetous. That is when, no, not allowed. Get right with God, repent, and then you could come back in. But until then, no. That's a serious sin, and we see that covetousness is in that. Now, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And starting in verse number one, the Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks." For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them." Serious sin. We see the seriousness in these chapters saying, look, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints. You're saved from that. You don't need to even be talking about that stuff. He's saying the judgment of God is going to come upon the children of men for all these things. Don't get caught up in it. Don't listen to the vain words of this world that's trying to tell you, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad. It's just fine. Eh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a sin. You better believe it's a sin. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely wicked sin. So why is it that this is dealt with so seriously? Why? Why is covetousness so bad? We see that it could get someone kicked out of church. We see that it shouldn't be once named among us as become a saint. Why is it so bad? Turn, if you would, to... Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. One of the reasons why it's so serious is because covetousness leads to oppression and violence. You may say, well, how does that work? I mean, if I just look at something, I want it. If I just want something in my heart, like, how, how, where do you get oppression and violence out of that? That's what it leads to. I'll read to you from Micah chapter 2. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Go ahead and stay there. Micah chapter 2, verse number 1 says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. This is talking about wicked people who devise iniquity that 
covet other people's stuff. They're coveting someone else's land. So they come up with these ways to take them by violence. They'll take them by force. You remember um, Ahab, King Ahab. He coveted uh, Naboth's vineyard. Right? He wanted that vineyard. He says, right next to mine. He's like, man, that would be a great addition. It's a great vineyard. I want that. And Naboth's like, no. He's saying, um, you know, you can't have that. This is my inheritance. It'd be, it's, it wouldn't even be right for me to give that to you. And, um, and Ahab was upset. And what did he do? He took the land by violence. He told his, he cried about it to his wife. And his wife went and, and sent Satan worshippers, men's abelial, to go and lie about him so that he would be put to death. And then she's like, okay, go ahead and take the vineyard now. He's dead. He's out of the way. He's gone. And that's what covetousness leads to. He coveted something that he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have wanted that to begin with because it wasn't right for him to have it. It was not part of his inheritance. And the way that God laid it out is that every, every tribe, every man, every family had their own inheritance that they had. And it was not to just be given unto anyone else that that was his inheritance and um, Ahab wanted something he couldn't have and it was wicked and it led to violence and it led to the oppression um, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 6 look at verse number 6 the Bible says but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is why there's such a seriousness devoted to covetousness. Why is there such a serious punishment? Why do we not allow a covetous person to continue in church if they're called a brother? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. That's why it leads to Violence. That's why it leads to oppression because when, when you have your heart set on things you can't have, you start doing things that you shouldn't be doing in order to attain what your heart is set on. That's why Jesus said, hey, don't set your heart on the things that are of the earth. I mean, they're going to be burned up anyways. Set your heart on things that are above. Now look, it's easy to say, yes, I agree with that. It's another thing to put it into practice in your life. Don't forget the warning. This is a serious warning. We need to make sure every day of our life, when you leave here today, don't let this be some song that you just forget about. Say, oh man, Pastor Bruce, yeah, you preached a great sermon. What was that about? You talked to someone on Tuesday. What was that about? I don't know. I don't know. This is a warning about covetousness. We need to make sure that we have our hearts right and we don't get wrapped up because it, you're going to pierce yourselves through with many sorrows. It's going to destroy your life and make you miserable if you get caught up in covetousness of any kind. Now, greed is why that there is predatory lending to begin with, right? You have these, these payday loans and these loan sharks stuff, and they go out there and they're charging 30%, 40%, 50% interest on some loan because people are just greedy. They want that money. Greed is why people collect usury, which is also known as interest on money that's lent. When people borrow money, and, and, and think about this, what does that do? It oppresses the poor and keeps them poor. The, the reason why people borrow money is because they don't have any. Because they're poor and they're trying to survive. And now sometimes it's because they're covetous and they want things that they shouldn't have and they don't have the money to afford it, but they want it anyways. So people feed off of their covetousness with their own covetousness and say, okay, well, I'll give you some money, but you got to pay me even more. I mean, these days, it's like, you want to buy a house, you're going to be paying somebody interest to get a loan for that much unless you can, you can save up long enough to put cash down for a house, which hopefully that's the way you do it. I mean, I think that's the best way to do it. But even just to, just to, to, to have a dwelling place, you're either renting to some, you know, you're, you're either paying rent to someone, you don't own anything, or you're, you know, you're going to have to be paying usury to someone else. 
Just the, the whole concept of collecting usury, collecting interest on money that's borrowed, it is an oppression of the poor and just, just keeps them poor that much longer. Because now you just have to pay. And collecting interest on money lends is so attractive to people because you literally don't have to do any work. You just make money. You just make money. There's no work involved. Just make money. Just say, well, I've got this money and um, you're in need. You have a need. Here you go. I'll give you some money, but you just got to pay me more. You just got to keep paying me more money. You know, 5%, 10%, whatever it may be. And the person lends the money, you don't have to do anything about it. And that's wickedness. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, turn if you would to um, Luke chapter 12. Well, let's keep you in the New Testament as long as there. Luke chapter 12. Proverbs 21 verse 25 says, The desire of the slothful, slothful someone who's lazy, slothful someone who, who doesn't want to work, excuse me, the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. So he's saying the lazy man, the desire of that slothful man is going to kill him because he doesn't want to work, but he coveteth greedily all the day long. And it's the slothful man that's going to want to get exact usury on someone else. You say, oh, I have this money. I don't even have to do any work for it. And he coveted, he's going to covet greedily all the day long. Right? Because he's lady, he's slothful, he doesn't want to do anything. He just wants to collect money off the backs of other people. It says, but the righteous will giveth and spareth not. The righteous will give and not charge that interest. The righteous will say, oh, you have a need? Here, what do you need? You know, a few hundred bucks, thousand bucks, whatever. Here you go, brother. You know, and, and no one, and when you're among God's people, don't ever charge someone interest. That if, you're, if you're willing to lend somebody money, if you want to be nice and help someone out because they have a need and they want to borrow some money and you're willing to do that, don't do it to make a gain or a profit off of that person. You want to lend some money to someone, because that's wickedness. Okay, and that's a whole other sermon on usury. But don't ever charge interest to somebody that wants to borrow money from you. I mean, if you have the money and you can afford it and you can, you can lend it out to them to help them out and be a blessing, great. Don't you charge interest and, and collect money off of them because that is wickedness. That is oppression. You're in Luke chapter 12. Jesus warns about covetousness in this story. Luke chapter 12, verse number 13. Luke 12, 13 says, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, I love this story because, look, for all we know, we don't get very much information, very much details about this guy. He comes to Jesus and just says, Jesus, you know, I need your help. Can you speak to my brother and tell him that he needs to divide the inheritance with me? Like it's not all his, he needs to divide it with me. Now, for all we know, this guy is honest, he's telling the truth, and maybe his brother is just totally being dishonest and, and being unfair and doing something that he shouldn't be doing and he should be dividing it. But... Jesus' reaction, he doesn't care. It doesn't matter whether or not he's being treated right or wrong. Jesus doesn't ask the details. He doesn't say, well, what, you know, like, like, are you being wronged? Is it, did, I mean, is this, you had a contract and, or whatever, you know, like the, your father's will, or, you know, are you the firstborn, whatever. Like he didn't, he didn't go into the details of it. He just says, look, who made me a judge or divider over you? He doesn't care about the money, about the financial stuff. And this is one of the places where we can get caught up in this because you can say, I'm right. Right? I mean, that's right. You can say, look, I'm right. I, I, this belongs to me. I deserve this. But he's bringing this issue to God and, and Jesus is saying like, look, who made me a judge or a, a divider over you? And he says unto everybody, watch out. It's a warning. Take heed. Beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Now, 
we need to be careful that we don't get so focused. I mean, he's coming to Jesus for a financial problem, like, like, like just something about an inheritance, which ultimately doesn't matter. And the point that Jesus is making is that the money doesn't matter at all. Jesus cared so much about money that the person carrying the money in his ministry was a thief, was Judas. You think he didn't know that? Of course he knew. He knew he was the one that was going to betray him. He knew he was a reprobate. He knew he was a thief. Jesus didn't care about the money at all. If he even cared about it a little bit, he wouldn't have had Judas in charge of the bag. And that's what he's saying here. Look, the money means nothing. Less than nothing. Beware of covetousness because it's so easy to get caught up into this mentality. Look, myself included, everybody. We need to beware of this. Beware of covetousness because it will pierce you through with many sorrows. Now, coveting is not just something financial. That's the most easily understood, most recognized, and probably the most common, maybe. But it's not just wanting more money and things and, 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 and you know possessions. It's wanting things that you can't or shouldn't have. Now, for example, wanting another man's wife, right? That was in Exodus chapter 20. That was in there, you know, coveting an, a, another person's wife. Well, that's not something you're going to go out and purchase, right? That's not, that's not anything you're, you're trying to get more money for. That's just someone else's wife. I mean, in a way, it's property because, you know, your wife belongs to the husband, just the husband belongs to the wife. I mean, that's yours, right? That's theirs. That is not anybody else's. So when you covet after someone else's spouse or someone else's wife, that is something that you can't have and that's wickedness. Obviously, that's wickedness, but that's coveting um, something other than money. Um, or how about this? Let's say, you know, because normally people think about coveting after another person's husband or wife in the sense that you see someone else and you have an attraction or, or what, for whatever reason you think they're better than your spouse or whatever, you have this, this covetousness towards them. But here's another form of covetousness. Say, you don't even have to have anybody in mind, but you're starting to think and despise your own spouse and say, well, I just wish I was married to someone else. And say, I don't even know who it might be. It doesn't really matter. I just wish I wasn't married to this person, was uh, married to someone else. You're coveting in your house. You're coveting someone else, even if that person is unknown. That is a wicked attitude to have because that is something that you can't have. You have your husband. You have your wife. You're there. You've made a vow and you've agreed for death till death to your part. Don't even have these thoughts of covetousness towards someone else, even if you don't know who it is. It doesn't matter. And this can go for any of God's commandments. Now, when we talk about a desire or a lust or wanting to do something else, wanting to commit a sin, that, you know, something you know that's wrong, that could be covetous too. You're, you're desiring, you're wanting to do something, you're wanting something that you shouldn't have, that is restricted from you. That is a covetous, covetous heart and attitude. For example, you want to get drunk. You're wanting to get high. Right? You're wanting to do these things that are against God's commandments. Things that are sins. But when you start to have that desire and you say, well, I just really want to do these things. That is covetous too. That is a form of covetous. Wanting to do anything contrary to God's commandments is covetousness because you can't do those things, but you want to anyways. And this should hit home for just about everybody because wanting to do anything contrary to God's law is a form of covetousness and it's the lust of your flesh that's driving you to want to do these sins right I mean well if it's drinking well it feels good your body really wants to feel that getting high you know fornicating adultery all these things it's, it's this lust of your flesh and what is lust that's covetousness that's what it is the Bible says in Romans Chapter 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. The lusts of your flesh is covetousness towards things that you can't have. It's that the lust and covet are, are pretty much synonymous. That's what he's saying in Romans 7, 7. 
Ultimately, though, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Covetousness boils down to self-centeredness. Okay? And if you want to try to, to get something applicable in your life, if you understand, yes, Covetousness is dangerous. Yes, I should be keeping from covetousness as much as possible, but how do I do that? How? How can I do that in my daily life? What can I do? Well, what one, recognize it when it starts to happen. Remember the scriptures. Remember the sermon. Remember this teaching and say, yes, I was warned about this. Yes, this is something I shouldn't have. This is something I can't have. This is something that is covetousness and stop it dead in its tracks. But really it boils down to a deeper heart issue. Covetousness itself is something that resides in your heart. And what you, if you want to be proactive instead of waiting for it to start to happen and then stopping it, if you want to be more proactive to say, I don't ever want to have a covetous attitude, you have to lose your sense, any sense of self-centeredness. Because when you covet things, it's things that you want to have for you. You want, however you want to satisfy the lust of your flesh, whatever it's on, you're thinking about yourself. You're trying to gratify some desire that you have that you shouldn't have as a sin or whatever it may be, that is where the problem stems in your heart. You're thinking about yourself. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number 2. I love this passage. Philippians chapter number 2. If you can get this mindset down consistently in your life, if you can get your heart into this way of thinking, if you get your heart right on this, the impact would be unlike any other change you've ever made in your life short of your salvation. If you can make this change of your attitude, of your heart, in your mind, if you can have this type of an attitude, your entire life would be revolutionized into a way that is much, much, much more godly. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Let nothing be done through strife, that's fighting or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the mind of Christ. If you want to be like Christ, this is the mind that you need to have. Esteeming others better than yourself. Christ lived that to a T. Everything Christ did with his life was for others. When did Jesus ever just satisfy his own desires or wants? Never. Not once. He lived for other people. He died for other people. He had sleepless nights, homeless, out in the cold, out in the rain, whatever it may be, healing people, feeding people. Everything he did was for others. And of anybody in the world who deserved to be served as opposed to serving others, the king of kings. If anybody deserved to be served by people, it was Jesus Christ. He would have full righteous authority over people to command, yeah, you serve me. But what did he do? The mind that Christ had, he came and served. He served so much, he got down on his hands and knees and he washed his disciples' feet. That's the mindset that he had. How in the world is he going to be covetous when he's thinking about how can I help this person? What can I do for them? How am I going to be able to help these people? They all are in need of a help. He's seeking, he's going to seek and to save that which is lost. He's trying to heal people. He's trying to do all of these things that he needs to do because he's thinking about everybody else. He had no time to think about himself. And even when he did have a chance, 
He made sure it was according to God's will in the garden. He says, if this cup, you know, he wanted the cup to pass from him. He said, God, is there any other way that we can accomplish this? Is there any other way we can do this? If there was another way other than him having to go through what he went through and being crucified, he would have taken it. But there was no other way. And that's why I said, not my will, but thine be done, O Lord. Even in that situation, and that wasn't covetousness. He was just looking for another way. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, he's just looking for, for another way to, do, to accomplish what he was sent to do. Oh, there's not another way? Well, then that's what I'm doing. No complaining, no griping, no moaning. That's what I'm going to do. And the focus still wasn't changed of being, having a mind for other people. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I can't emphasize enough this mindset. We see how wicked covetousness is. We see how serious of a sin it is. It's the Tenth Commandment. Not only that, there, there's other repercussions. There's a lot of things. Hey, the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil stems from that root of loving money and being covetous. All of that can be avoided and defeated if we had a mind that was like Christ's, esteeming others better than ourselves, and, and not having a self-centered type of an attitude. This can apply to every aspect of your life. It can apply at the home, with your spouse, with your children, with your, your boss, everywhere. With other people you don't even know. It takes humility. You can't have pride to be willing to serve other people and say, well, I don't like this person because they do this and they do that, so I don't want to help them out. It's pride. Why? Because you're better than them? Is that why you don't want to help? I don't think Jesus Christ had that attitude when he died on the cross for your sin saying, they did this and that and I'm not going to help that person out. Heed the warning tonight. Heed the warning of covetousness. Try to make the change in your hearts. Don't forget this sermon. Don't forget this truth, more importantly, from God's Word. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the warnings that you've given us. God, help us not to um, just dismiss what we hear from your Word, and, and uh, especially, especially, dear Lord, with these subjects that you're so serious about. And um, they're not just words on a page. God, this is our life. Help us to get our hearts right with you. Help us to get our mindset and it, it, everything in order. It's difficult dear God. I know this is a struggle. But help us, Lord, strengthen us. Help us to be reminded of these things so that we can make the changes that are necessary so that we don't get lifted up in our own pride but that we can have the very mind of Christ. Lord, I know that that would do wonders in our lives if we can just get this one thing right and it would avoid so many heartaches, so many troubles um, if, we can just, if we can just do this right, dear Lord. We, we love you. We thank you for your commandments that are looking out for us. Help us to understand them better and to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.